everybody. Video here for you today. Now, you know I like bringing you many different aspects of ancient history. Sometimes my videos are just set to music. Sometimes you get a tour from somebody like John Anthony West, and today's the day. I have not made a video on Karnak for a long time, but this is one of the biggest religious buildings in the world, if you want to call it that. But this is uh, built up over at least a couple thousand years in the history here. When does it first start? Well, I think it's just like the Temple of Dendera or the Temple of Horus at Edfu. It goes back to the Old Kingdom, maybe further, the original foundations of this place here. Let's go down and take a look. Here's the temple at the bottom here. These are the Avenue of the Ram Sphinxes, the God of Moon. Better name for them, but this temple is laid out specifically with the sun in mind here. Here is the winter solstice sunrise at Karnak. This place tells a story, and it's based on the movement of the sun here. Here's the entrance to the temple. The god of moon, represented by the ram sphinxes, as they are called. Here's a link I will leave below. Ancient Origins put this story out about a month ago. Amun, the creator god whose supremacy surpassed Egypt. But that's what this place is based on, this temple. It's a temple of a moon. Here it says statues of a moon in the form of a ram at Karnak Temple in Luxor. Ancient Thebes. Historically, a moon was not always worshipped prominently around Egypt. His cult grew in importance with the ongoing political developments. One of the earliest events that made a moon even more popular happened around the time of the 11th dynasty, roughly 4,100 years ago. The dynasty hailed from Thebes, brought the prominence of their favorite deities, and the chief of these was a moon. Karnak is certainly one of the most famous temples in Egypt. A lot of symbolism placed in here. John Anthony West is going to talk about that in a second. But this place started to really thrive around maybe 4,000 years ago. But this is one of the original spots that they say creation took place. And the temples were built when the primordial mounds were exposed after the floodwaters receded. I suspect here older temples were ruined and then newer temples were built by the kings of Egypt. The 18th dynasty coming from around 3,400 years ago. Many kings, pharaohs built here. This was a very sacred place to many different eras of Egyptian history. And it probably went right back to the beginning, whenever that was originally. Here is a sacred lake at the Karnak Temple here. John Anthony West is going to show you around many different areas, give you a few of his thoughts. This seems to be a very sacred place. Very ancient place in Egypt. Now I'm going to let the late great John Anthony West take over. This is a video of him and Karnak in 2015. This comes from my friend Carlos's channel. This comes from an hour and 20 minute video, about a 12 minute clip here. I'll leave the full link to the video and Carlos's channel below. But this will give you a look, a little tour in these days when not much travel is taking place. Here's a tour of Karnak and John Anthony West. Hope you enjoy it and you all have. Very safe. As you see, we've now been in quite a few temples, and the hyperstyle halls all have the same basic structure. It means covered hall. And what you see here is not what you get really, because A, it would have been all, the central aisle would have been open to the sky. And then the unique feature on the second row of columns, you see it has that sort of lattice window up above there. So the light. The only light, apart from the direct light for the thing, was coming into the covered hall through those lattices. So it's a kind of an indirect light. And then, of course, everything is completely painted. As we can get you through, there's quite a bit of color still left under the architrave. So the sides would be covered with ceilings. Yeah, all well, the sides would be covered. I mean, hyperstyle means covered hall. <coughs> so the and the columns, the papyrus columns are meant to represent, of course, the, the closely packed papyrus plants. And the usual explanation for why they should put them so close together is that they didn't really understand the load-bearing qualities of columns, as if having been building temples for the last 1,500 years, they wouldn't have figured out the load-bearing all this kind of mind about them. So what they're doing actually here, <coughs> as as opposed 
So let's say Luxor, where where the the hypostyle hall represents the lungs, and you have the moon carved into the faces of the moon carved into the bases of the columns. Here they're recreating, in so far as is possible, the feeling of an actual papyrus swamp, which is like a rainforest and teeming with wildlife and all the rest of it. And we'll see that represented when we go to Saqqara, which we haven't done yet. So that's the feeling of this place, and you can imagine what it's like when it's completely colored, but in a suffused light, and you know the, the ceremonies and all of that are going on. That said, there are some very strange features in here, and I don't think it has to do with the the reconstruction of the columns, because they come down, you know where every everything is. I mean, they're, they're right in place. But as you look at the bases of the columns here, and some of them you can see are originals, they're the original stones, they're all different heights. Now, that, this is another nice little, maybe, maybe a master's thesis, to figure out why, if there's a, there's a rhyme or reason for that. But obviously, it's tons more work to, to have to build every column individually instead of starting out with columns all a certain height and then all the drums are going to be the same height and you're going to finish up with them the same height at the top. Here, every column has to be designed individually to get exactly up to where it's all going to be even at the top. This is, to me, seems like a mind-blowing task and there has to be some commanding reason for it. I picked it again with some certain of the color, the Shahuti, um, Conference Wisdom and Horus throwing, you know, cascading the water of life over the queen, very, very, very carefully the face, um, and so her other images as well. But what's, what's interesting about this, I mean, apart from the obvious artwork and so on, is that if you stand in the middle where I am, you see that the center of the doorway lines up exactly with her obelisk, and if you follow that axis all the way across the river, it goes right up the ramp that leads into her temple. Huh. So it's all like, you know, just, you have to be thinking in a particular way to do something like that. Um, and you have to know, there has to be some good reason why they're doing that, which of course we don't know, but if it's important enough for them to do that kind of careful surveying, it should interest us to try and figure out why. Two things here. One, regards, regarding Hatshepsut. The, talked about at the temple. At the temple, the, after, at some point or another, she transgressed, probably by calling herself Pharaoh, and supposedly took Moses III, her half-brother, what was it, Silas, stepson, what was it? Moses no, the third is her stepson. Stepson, right. Um, decides to efface everything that's takes, uh, that is part of the transgression. But now there's even, I think, even in academia, there are some questions about whether or not it's Moses is really responsible, maybe, maybe not. But anyway, it plays a role here because these, this, hush, this huge obelisk here, and the, uh, the other one that would have been on the other side, um, because they're always in pairs as, as at, um, at Luxor. Um, with that again, Moses goes to build his addition to the temple, so that's that smaller um, obelisk is put Moses the third, and so the theory goes that he wants to hide from public view all memory to erase all memory of Hatshepsut. So what he does is he builds a wall around the obelisk to <coughs> hide it from view. And if you look up at the obelisk, you see about two-thirds of the way up. It's, it's lighter up there, so that's where the wall went up to, um, about two-thirds of the way up. The problem with that, the objective is to hide it from view, that with the top third of it, top third of it, in view, it's visible for probably a hundred miles. 
around. Too. So this is not a terribly intelligent way to hide from view. So there must be some other reason why he's doing that, that the obelisk represents their tuning forks, literally tuning forks, tuning the temple to the, to the energies of the, um, you know, to the earth energies that are, that are, are always flowing. And so when it's his turn to, to build his part of the temple, which of course changes the geometry of the temple, he's going to put up his own obelisks. But these are also standing here. And so what he does is he puts the wall around it to dampen it in some sense or another. David, you probably fill in the details of that. But it's obviously not to hide it from view because it isn't hidden from view. But it would serve to to change the vibrations or to still the vibrations that are otherwise that are otherwise um, active. So that's one here, interesting thing. Here but not elsewhere, on this wall, this is the western wall, so it's the place of completion and of transformation. Here you see a number of plants, but the easiest one to recognize is the lotus flower, throwing off another lotus flower without mm. without dropping a seed. In other words, it's asexual or, or virgin birth. It's born again in the plant, in the plant, um, you know, in the botanical world, which does happen. It's rare, but it does happen. And there are other plants here that are doing the same thing. I was giving the explanation one day. So this is, this is a place of transformation, and an illustration, in fact, that that this happens not just with us. When with us, it has to be from inner work. Um, idea here, and there was a guy on my trip, but he said, "Wow," he said, "That's interesting." I'm a botanist, and he said that those plants on the other wall are ancient, 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 like Jurassic plants. They're the oldest plants known from the, you know, in other words, from the, what do you call it, from the, um, not paleographic, but from the... Paleozoic? Well, from the prehistorical, you know, from, yeah, even more than paleolithic, it's in other words, yeah, like... Like Cambrian or something like that, oh, you know. Yeah, in yeah, other yeah. words, way, way back, Pre-Cambrian. those plants still exist, but they're the oldest plants. Wow. Now, this this is interesting because a it means that the Egyptians knew which plants to put there, you know, and they don't have fossils or whatever. And yet, all of those plants that are there are the ancient, ancient plants. They're not daisies and, you know, mm-hmm. and hybrid tomatoes or whatever. They're they're <laughs> they're and ancient, ancient pre-geological plants. So this is, that's pretty cool. <laughs> they do that. only show up like in the fossil records? Yeah, that, is that, well, I think they still exist now, but they knew that those were the old plants, so they could have put other plants there as well. But there, which is the east where things arise from, they have the old plants. So this is, this is knowledge, and this, I, we won't talk about this now, but they have a way of acquiring knowledge that has nothing to do with the way we acquire it. was here that the golden boat of Amon was kept and once a year taken out of here and down the avenue of Sphinxes in the great procession. No, sorry, to the Nile and then down <coughs> to, um, to Luxor Temple and brought in through the doorway and then back through the avenue of Sphinxes to here. So do they think this is the original um, plinth, or do they think that that was rebuilt too? This? Yes. Oh, I don't know that anybody addressed it, but my, my bet would be that it's the original. <coughs> this is the sacred lake, and in typical Karnak fashion, it's a Karnak-sized sacred lake. <laughs> this is a sacred Olympic swimming pool. Um, and it's here that the priests would do their morning ablutions, Quite possibly the origin of Christian baptism. Maybe not, because practically all societies, no matter traditional, sophisticated, prim- uh, you know, pr- primitive, tribal, all have the have a, a, a purification by water. Sure, but ritual. They said that there were 30,000 priests who were living in Karnak, or who you know were at Karnak doing the officiating and so on. So I reckon actually you measure them. This pool holds exactly 30,000 priests. You, mean, you get 30,000 priests and put them in here, you'll find they just fit. <laughs> anyway, it's a very big sacred lake. It's fed by the Nile. Periodically, it's absolutely filthy, and now they have it cleaned up, so maybe they have some sort of a filtering system. I'm not sure what. And on either, on all four corners, 
we talked about the scarab. There's one scarab left that they moved, which is really stupid because it was good where it was. On each of the four corners was a, a big, massive scarab beetle, a carved scarab beetle, transformational power of the sun on the sacred lake. You know, the, the symbolism, when you, when you, even when you're on a, on a sort of quite simple level, you see the, how the symbolism resonates. Everything, everything has a resonance, and even if you don't, I mean, even you know just a little bit about it, you you get the sense of that resonance. By now, you should all be having it. It's, 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 you know, two thirds of the way through the trip, and and each day is a different message or set of mes of messages. All of them realized. You know, quite spectacularly, and of course extending over 3,000 years, uh, by now you should be getting, um, and you're welcome to disagree, I don't want to bother me, um, the difference between what we call progress and what was actually civilization and something that lasts 3,000 years. So let's, let's